Today's episode was sponsored by Ashley Valencia over on Patreon. Um, Ashley asked for teal, and uh, then I went to make the patch, and I realized that I didn't know what teal is, so I did my best to approximate teal. Hopefully this is teal enough, but if not, I apologize. Anyway, thank you so much, Ashley, and let's go ahead and get this patch up on the wall. Yeah! So, uh, yeah, here it is. Um, as always, I have no idea if it's actually in frame, but I promise you that it is there. Also, you may be noticing that I thanked Ashley, but the patch starts with an E, which is not normally how you spell Ashley. That's because those are actually her dad's initials. Uh, he unfortunately passed recently, and she says she likes putting them out into the world. And honestly, I think that's so cool and beautiful. Oh, although it does kind of create a problem for me, because normally in this part of the video, I would make a little joke. But uh, that feels wrong, given the circumstances. So, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what to do right now. Boobies. I'm sorry, that was very inappropriate. Um, feelings make me uncomfortable. I asked Ashley if she had any special shout out she wanted me to say, and she did. So, um, shout out to her dog, Gary. She's sorry she spelled your name like that. And also, shout out to her sibling, Alyssa. Y you're pretty okay, I guess. She guesses. I'm. I'm speaking for Ashley when I say that. I feel like you're probably better than okay. I think Ashley's probably being sarcastic. It, it seems like she loves you very much. Also, just one more time for the road, shout out to Ashley's dad. Um, it is great to remember the people you love, so let's all do that. Even if feelings are hard for some of us. But, but yeah, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and start the episode. I've been thinking a lot about guns lately because... Well, I'm an American. It's hard not to think about them. News of mass shootings has become so prevalent that it's almost not even news anymore. There are so many at this point that it's basically impossible to even try and care about them on an individual level, and you kind of just become numb to it because that's the only way to survive. So, no matter how much you try to drown it out, it's always there. It lives in the back of your head as this dull hum, and it only takes one loud noise or person acting strange on the subway for it to jump front and center and become all you can think about. It's a weird way to live, and I kind of wanted to talk about it. Of course, I'm emotionally stunted, so I can't just talk about it directly. Instead, I decided to talk about a movie about guns, because... Yeah, that's how I communicate my feelings now. Since I make videos about Christian movies sometimes, and since Christians in America fucking love guns for some reason, I figure that there could be some fun overlap there. So I googled pro-gun Christian movie and found something called The Reliant, which was everything I was hoping for and then some. It's kind of just the worst case scenario that people imagine when they talk about why they need a gun crammed into the form of an action movie, and I found it truly fascinating because watching it very much feels like I'm getting a peek inside gun people's heads. It opens in a hospital as a bloodied father brings his daughter in for treatment after a car accident. And thankfully for him, Christian movie mainstay and guy who tweeted this, Kevin Sorbo, is there to save the day. 
Doctor, have you seen Dr. Raleigh? Dr. Raleigh's in a coat. I'll take care of the kids. You wait for daddy. Right there, okay? But your wife's having a baby. You shouldn't be here. No, oh, no, it's just one floor up. I'm gonna get plenty of time. Tell me what happened, sir. Actually, I feel like you probably shouldn't be here. Uh, not for any medical reason or anything like that. Just because, like... I don't know. Your wife is in labor. Take the day off and go be with her. Kevin Sorbo wheels the little girl back to the ER and makes the father stay in the waiting room because... Actually, I'm not sure why. I think maybe because Kevin Sorbo sees that he's a little drunk. I gotta go. I gotta be with Security. Sir, how much alcohol have you had today? Hmm? Wait, what? Security. Keep him here, please. Keep him here. I gotta go with her. Your Listen, daughter's daughter. safe in my hand. I will take care of her, all right? Excuse That's me. My, I have to go oh. with him. I have to go Man. with him. I've never worked at a hospital. I, I don't know the exact protocol for what should happen here, but it does feel like they jumped to security pretty quickly. His daughter is dying, so I feel, I feel like maybe try to talk to him a little bit before you go physically restraining him. They don't do that, though, and naturally, this leads to him stealing a cop's gun. Back off! Oh, back off! Hey, 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 You pull that trigger and you will never see your daughter again. You will see tomorrow, unless I see my faith. I think that right there was the moment I knew that this was going to be something special, because the daughter in this Christian movie's name is Faith, and, like, I don't know if you guys know this, but that word usually means something very different when you're talking about Christianity. And I guess I can't say for sure, but, but I feel like the screenwriter was very aware of that fact. Look how you're freaking out the kids. Think of your little girl, Faith, right? What would Faith want you to do? <laughs> She's hard. I don't know, maybe I'm just overthinking things here, but I really feel like that line is supposed to have some hidden, deeper meaning to it. Eventually, the dad drops the gun, and we flash forward seven years to Kevin Sorbo's now adult daughter planning her wedding. Oh, that one. Did you find your dress yet? No way, mister. <laughs> the first time you're going to see me in my wedding dress is when I'm walking down the aisle. Um, why, why do you get to see my tux? But I can Are see you going to cry? <sighs> Remember when we were like that? Hey. Mr. the one. They're happy. Uh, I bet things are always going to be this way. In the other room of this happy house, Kevin Sorbo's happy sons are playing a happy game of chess while some very not happy images are playing on the TV behind them. Hmm. Mm, uh, yeah, that's a great move. Oh, even better. It's getting worse. Cities all due to the collapse of the dollar and the panic looting and governmental chaos that followed. The National Guard and local responders are overwhelmed in the bigger metropolitan areas. Smaller towns and I can't rural areas are safer, but... That news report is the only real insight we ever get into what these riots are, and... I gotta say, I'm still a little bit confused. The reporter says that they were caused by the collapse of the dollar, but a few seconds later, they also say that it's people protesting because there were mass layoffs at a plant, so... Yeah, I'm not entirely sure why they're happening, but... That said, I do feel very confident that there's an earlier draft of this script where there were Black Lives Matter rallies. Also, the reporter mentions that the National Guard and local first responders are overwhelmed, which is very silly to me for a couple of reasons, the most important of which is 
No, they're not. According to some light Googling I did, the national defense budget of the United States in 2024 was $841 billion. So I feel like if the National Guard gets called in, they're gonna be fine. Like they might not be able to help injured people or anything like that, but they'll certainly be able to hurt the protesters. And that's if they're called in. I feel like nine times out of 10, things won't get that far. The movie specifically calls out the police departments in major metropolitan areas, and generally speaking, they're pretty well stocked themselves. If the police forces in the United States are overwhelmed by a few dozen protesters, then they are truly terrible at their jobs because they are the ones who get most of the funding. Uh, like look at what teachers are given to do their job and then talk to me about overwhelmed. The NYPD where I live has six submarine drones. Uh, I don't know what those are or why they need them, but they sound expensive and six feels like a lot to me. A bunch of rioters fighting the cops in a major metropolitan city in the United States is kind of like if you were to fight a squirrel. Uh, like sure, the squirrel can cause some problems and maybe even do a little bit of damage, but ultimately you're still probably gonna win that fight based on sheer size alone. There have been many, many real world riots in recent memory that looked way more intense than what was on that TV. and. The police always went out in the end. Uh, I'm not saying that that's a good thing, but it is true. Also, I find it very interesting that the villains in this pro-gun movie are a group of people who have seemingly overpowered the government because when I was growing up, that's who the gun people were trying to be. As I understand it, the spirit of the Second Amendment is to empower the individual and make sure that citizens have the ability to fight against any potential tyranny. So for the filmmakers to frame this movie is like, these pores have gotten out of hand and now our friend the government needs our help stopping them. It feels like they've lost the plot a little bit. Before the boys can contemplate the oncoming apocalypse, their little sister comes in to tell them to come downstairs. It's the older boy's 21st birthday, and it's time to celebrate. Happy birthday, dear Jimmy. Happy birthday to you. Oh, I wanted that. Okay, what's it gonna be? Uh, cake? Or presents. Presents, presents, presents. Why are those little kids so excited for presents? It's not their birthday, so they ain't getting shit. If it were me, I would have said cake. Also, it's very bright outside, so they're either having cake with breakfast or have decided to celebrate at 3 p.m. Uh, either way, this is probably the geekiest 21st birthday that I have ever seen in my life. Like, uh, give the kid a shot of gin or something. Although I guess once the presents come out, things do start to get a little bit more grown up. I'm starting first. Here you go. Oh. Happy birthday. Oh. Oh. Okay, obviously I'm not a gun person, but a gun still feels like a very weird present to me. And I'm not saying that as anxious Willie who hates guns and gets horrible intrusive thoughts anytime I'm in the same room as one. I'm saying that as devil's advocate Willie who is genuinely trying to understand gun culture and needs to comment on the clips I show you enough that this video constitutes fair use. Because if I take what pro-gun people say at face value, then it feels to me like they should view their guns as like, uh, like, like, like an appliance, you know? It, it's a tool to protect themselves. But, but, but if people treated their appliances the way that certain people treat guns, then that would be very strange.
Every time I see someone showing off their massive collection or a conservative senator releasing a Christmas card of their family holding AKs in front of a tree, I always mentally replace the firearms with toasters. And nine times out of ten, whatever they're doing starts to feel like like bizarre more than anything. And if my parents were to give me a toaster for my 21st birthday, I'd say thanks, I guess. I don't know, it's not like a bad gift, but it's kind of weird and not particularly exciting. And I'm not the only person who thinks that it's a bad gift. The oldest daughter also thinks that it sucks, although she's more opposed on, like, uh, like moral reasons and such. How could you get him that? You knew about this? I'm sorry, I, I didn't get a chance to talk to her about it. Well, how could... Uh... Sophie, please don't ruin Look, it. we are gonna please. be safe, Sophie, all right? Safety lessons first. Yeah, you know I'm a better shot than you anyways, oh, Dad. Yeah. On their birthday, no less. I'm not going to tell you what she meant by that because it is an insane reveal and I kind of want to save it for later, but just know that she is absolutely right. A gun is the worst thing he could have given that boy. Also, this is the first of many, many times that they talk about gun safety and every time they do it, it kind of bugs me. Hey, don't get me wrong, I think that practicing proper gun safety is a very good thing to do, but the way they discuss it in this movie is so blatant that it almost feels like a fuck you more than anything. Everyone here is so conspicuously diligent about how they handle firearms that it very much seems like the movie is trying to preempt criticisms by being like, Look at how safe everyone is being. How, how could you say that they shouldn't have guns? And it's like, okay, great. I'm happy that this one family is so careful, but not everyone is. That's kind of the point. Uh, also, this family isn't always that careful, but again, we'll talk about that later. The movie is clearly trying to use proper precautions as an argument against gun control, but as far as I'm concerned, it kind of accomplishes the opposite, because if you're aware of how important gun safety is, then wouldn't you want to try and ensure that the only people with guns are the ones who practice it? After that super cool party, Kevin Sorbo takes the menfolk to the shooting range to go break in his son's new present. And from there, things pretty much just go to shit. They get their first glimpse at the protesters on the car ride over. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So much for chaos staying in the big cities. Hear that, audience? Nobody's safe. By the time they stop at the store to pick up some ammunition, it's a full-on apocalypse. Our uh, credit card machine's down. It's, it's been down all day. I'm uh, sorry, we're closing early today. Last sale. Get the weapons in the safe now. Please leave up peacefully and quietly out the back doors. Stay safe. For those wondering, yes, that is Eric Roberts. Uh, I think with this movie, he is now officially the person who has appeared on this channel the most times after me. Also, the mom's motivations are never made super clear, so maybe they have their reasons, but why are they trying so hard to break into a sporting goods store right now? Uh, I'm not really sure what they have to gain from that. I guess one guy does steal the money out of the cash register, but like, it doesn't really seem like all that much. Uh, I feel like if everyone were to split that, they'd all end up with like a buck fifty each. And they really want to get in there. They're clawing at the door and 
Then when that doesn't work, one dude straight up drives a motorcycle through the glass. I actually think that the way the protesters are treated here is interesting because as best as I can tell, the movie kind of just sees them as evil. They have a motivation. Sort of. It's not made exactly clear, but it does seem like they're protesting for financial reasons. That said though, who exactly their ire is directed towards is never made explicit. And as best as I can tell, it's just anyone in their path. These people suffered some sort of monetary crisis and instantly devolved into a mindless horde whose only goal is destruction. Early parts of this almost feel like a zombie movie, and I think that the way it dehumanizes the enemy speaks to how certain pro-gun people seem to view the world. Things are black and white. It's us first them, and we need to make ourselves as strong as possible by stocking up on guns because they are out to get us. Kevin Sorbo definitely seems to think this way because he apparently loves guns so much that he keeps one strapped to his ankle. It feels like that would be kind of a bitch to walk around with all day, but you know, whatever, do you? He pulls it out and uses it to make his way through the riot and back home, where he does his best to lead his family to safety. What's happening? That's not gun attack. People are getting killed. Are you hurt? No, I'm fine, I'm fine, but we have to get out of here. You know, I don't make great decisions under pressure. I, I once tried to get out of a speeding ticket by challenging the cop to a rap battle, but... Even still, I feel pretty confident that leaving is not a very good idea. God only knows what's out there and how far it reaches, so I feel like the best thing that you can do is just hunker down. Especially if you're these people. Like, I feel like the whole reason you become a gun nut is for this exact moment. What's the point of being obsessed with this stuff? If you're not going to sit your ass in a rocking chair and shoot anyone who comes on your lawn with a shotgun. Whatever though, Kevin Sorbo seems to know what he's doing, so the family listens to him. Before they can leave though, the eldest son runs into the house to grab both a mysterious box and for some reason a katana. And in the time it takes for him to come back out, the angry mob has already followed them home. Adam, grab that rifle. Shells are in the trailer. We will defend ourselves! When people shoot a gun in the air like that, how does the bullet not just, like, turn around and shoot you in the head? Kevin Sorbo does it a couple of times in this movie, and for somebody who professes to practice proper gun safety, it does not feel particularly safe. Right now, some of you might be thinking that the idea that an angry mob would follow one specific family back to the suburbs to terrorize them is unrealistic, but the movie actually explains this. As it turns out, the guy leading the charge is this dude. Apparently, Kevin Sorbo was unable to save his daughter, and so now the guy blames him for the fact that he lost his faith. Which again, was the little girl's name. He's held a grudge against the doctor ever since, and now that he's out of prison, he's here to enact his revenge. And you know, I would have guessed that doing a DUI, a hit and run, and then stealing a cop's gun and drunkenly waving it around the children's wing of a hospital would get you more than seven years in jail, but apparently that's not the case. At the very least, you'd think it would mean that he couldn't get his hands on a gun anymore, but again, no. He has a sniper rifle now, and he's taking aim at the family. All right, Doc. Time for you to feel my pain. Where are you? Shut 
show yourself. Before this scene, I was a little bit worried that this movie wasn't going to be all that Christian, but thankfully I was wrong, because before he can do the unthinkable, he's stopped by a little divine intervention. Faith. Faith indeed. After that, Faith's dad makes a vow to not kill the kids, and I feel like it's meant to show the audience that there's still some good in him, because, spoiler, he does get redeemed by the end of this. That said though, even if he is ultimately meant to be a good guy, I'd still say that he's not a great guy, because by bringing the rioters to the family's house, he's responsible for a lot of bad shit. Like, they straight up kill Kevin Sorbo. Uh, I won't show it to you because I don't want to get demonetized, but they shoot him in the heart and both kneecaps. And this was actually pretty surprising. It happened so suddenly that I kind of kept expecting there to be a twist where it turned out that he survived, but he didn't. Uh, there's a scene later on where we see his corpse rotting on the front lawn, and you can tell that he's really dead because they color corrected him so that he's gray now. The rioters also cause the family to break up because the kids flee to the woods for safety. The daughter's fiance stays back to hold the rioters off with a shotgun, and the mom goes back inside to try and find the key to the gun safe. And they both end up getting kidnapped. Hey Jack, found your wife. <laughs> Why are you doing this to us? It's vengeance. <laughs> And again, this man is ultimately redeemed. I, I cannot stress that enough. The way the movie justifies this is by having him become obsessed with trying to rescue the kids to make up for his mistakes. I need to save those kids. Though I'm only gonna offer this once. Help me save her. But you'd think that if he were really interested in making up for his mistakes, he'd let those kids' mother go find them so she can take care of them. But he super doesn't do that. And that's especially egregious when you consider the fact that the youngest daughter is shot with a stray bullet while the kids are running away. So... Yeah, all in all, it's pretty hellish what this family goes through, and it's firmly that man's fault. By the way, that little girl's name? Also Faith. I didn't mention it earlier because I thought things were confusing enough already, but now when I talk about Faith, I'll probably be talking about her. Or, or I guess I could still be talking about the concept of belief in a higher power. I don't know, just use context clues. After the gunfight, we flash forward one month to see that the kids have adjusted to a new normal. Alright, not sure who taught them how to make a TP, but well done I guess, that looks cozy as hell. And I feel like this is where the movie starts to enter into unhinged territory. Like I said, it very much feels like we're getting a peek into what some pro-gun people are afraid will happen if they don't have their guns, and if that is the case, then I think that their fears are a bit unfounded. The rioters seemingly caused the end of American civilization. The town they're in becomes this wasteland where roaming gangs go from house to house pillaging from one another, and... Well, I guess I can't say this for sure. I feel pretty confident that that's not what would happen. Rioters are just people, and society is just people, so... If rioters cause the collapse of society then they're probably just going to start their own new society. 
right? And in the movie's defense, that could be what's happening, and we're just only seeing a small portion of this new world, but even still, that portion feels pretty unrealistic. The sense I get is that the goal here was to show the audience that the worst has happened, but the people making this didn't actually have a clear picture of what the worst would look like. And it all kind of makes me think that they don't even know what they're actually afraid of. Uh, six berries and one piece of jerky for each of us. Here, bud. These berries are sour. Eli, you're always wanting what we don't have. Be thankful and try it. Okay, there are five of them, so... Yeah, I don't know what kind of bush only produces 30 berries at a time, but... I feel like they probably should have kept looking until they found a second one. Although, who knows, maybe those berries are magic and six is all you need, because that was apparently enough to sustain faith despite the fact that she's still recovering from her gunshot wound a month after the fact. Desperate to keep their faith alive, the family decides to go back to their house for the first time to try and get her some antibiotics because... Well, that's apparently something that they keep lying around the house. I, I, I thought that was more of a prescription thing usually. Katana in hand, the two oldest siblings venture back to try and find provisions. And when they get there, the daughter breaks off to try and cover her own ass. So, we need to stay together. Hid the key to the gun safe? How dare you? <laughs> and this is supposed to be a big twist of the movie. After the daughter saw her dad give her brother a gun, she got so mad that she hid the key to the safe, and that meant that the family didn't have guns when they needed them. Once he finds out the truth, the brother is kind of pissed at her for the rest of the movie, and the implication seems to be that had they had the guns, things would have gone differently. And that's weird to me, because... Well, for one thing, they did have guns. As best as I can tell, two of the three family members who had any experience with firearms were armed. So I don't know what more they were hoping to accomplish by cracking into that safe. Uh, like, were they going to give a Glock to Faith? I think maybe the thinking here is that one of the weapons was automatic, so that would be enough to turn the tide, but like... Would it though? There were a bunch of people shooting at them from all different angles, so either they just started spraying bullets everywhere, there's still no guarantee that they would come out the other side unscathed, especially because... Well, spraying bullets everywhere just adds a whole host of new potential hazards to the situation. This feels like a very common way of thinking among the pro-gun contingent. I think that a lot of them have that Mark Wahlberg, 9-11 wouldn't have happened on my watch mindset. As best as I can tell, there are a lot of people who think that if you're in a bad situation, the only thing you need to get yourself out of it is a gun. And I really don't think that things are that simple. Like, I know that for me personally, one of the reasons I want gun control is because I know for a fact that if I were ever in a high stakes situation that required me to use a gun, I would fuck it up in some way. I know this will probably surprise a lot of you, but I'm not very coordinated. As far as I'm concerned, the best defense I can hope for is to try and make sure that the other guy doesn't have a gun, because otherwise things are probably going to end poorly for me. I also think it's weird that the brother gets so mad at her for hiding the key, because he is just as responsible for everything that happened, if not more so. Had he not gone back into the house to grab his box, they could have just driven off before the rioters got there, and this whole gun safe talk would be moot. And actually, while we're on the subject, 
Let's talk about that box. She uses those keys to grab the guns out of the safe, and then... Well, a lot happens, actually. I'm, I'm skipping over most of the movie right now, but it's mostly just them walking around the woods talking about Jesus and trying not to get shot. Really, the only thing you need to know is that one night, somebody breaks into their TP and steals the boy child's mystery box. I should probably start learning these characters' names. I'm, I'm running out of ways to say male family member. Jimmy! No, 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 no. What is it? My box. Eli! Emily, where is my box? <laughs> box. Later on, it's revealed that the thief is none other than the drunk dad from the opening scene. And when he and his gang come back to try and take more, the kids tie him to a tree and basically spend the next 20 minutes deciding whether or not to shoot him in the face at point blank range. Once they have him incapacitated, Jimmy goes through his shit and finds his stolen box. The, the, the son's name is Jimmy. I, I looked it up between takes. Unfortunately for Jimmy, though, there's something missing. It's not here. Jimmy! Where's the lock of hair? What? Where is the lock of blonde hair? All right, Super wasn't expecting him to say that, but yeah, apparently the reason the box is so important to him is because it contained a lock of blonde hair. And you know, creepy, but uh, there is a good reason why the hair is so special to him, and the movie explains that reason to us in a flashback. Becca, don't tell Jimmy, stop. Let me, I'll fix it. It's better now. I'll get you a hat and put back the scissors. I don't normally notice when people in movies are wearing wigs, but uh, that one is pretty hard to ignore. Uh, I'm fairly certain it was meant for an adult. The child that massive hair is connected to is Jimmy's twin sister. And if right now you're saying, but Jimmy doesn't have a twin sister, this is why. That little vignette is fucked up for a variety of reasons, but the one that sticks out the most in my mind is that it means that Kevin Sorbo celebrated what would have been the 21st birthday of his daughter by giving the person who shot her a rifle. And this movie is unapologetically pro-gun, so the idea that they would include this part is unfathomable to me. My best guess is that they were trying to tackle all sides of the gun argument as a way of being like, look, we knew what you were going to say, and we still want them, so checkmate liberals. But if that's truly how they feel, then it means that their obsession with guns is something truly pathological, because, like, what the fuck? I love television more than most things in this world, but if I lost my child because a TV fell on them, I don't think I'd ever want to see one again. At the very least, you'd think that the accident would make the family change how they did things, but I don't know that they did. 
Kevin Sorbo had the gun Jimmy used to shoot his sister strapped to his ankle, and we see in an earlier scene that he still does that. The fact that this movie seems to believe that people's love of guns is so powerful that they won't turn on them even when they cause the literal worst thing imaginable to happen suggests that there is something way bigger than politics going on here. But anyway, yeah, that's why that dude was freaking out over a lock of hair, and, like, he really freaks out. And who is responsible, Sophie? Who is responsible for it? Do you know whose fault this is? It's God! God is responsible! It's God's fault! That's who! I is he trying to shoot God right now? Jimmy really wants to kill that dude, and... While the rest of his family does try to stop him. I'm killing him. Stop! I'm killing him! He can still change, Jimmy. Remember the thief on the cross? He probably killed Dad! And he probably... God knows what he did to Mom, Eli! He shot Faith! Faith. They actually do come around to his way of thinking once Faith's dad admits that he's the one who effectively destroyed their lives. Before they can follow through with the unthinkable, though, the oldest daughter steps in and stops them by basically saying, like, we're Christians. That's not what we do. We're not going to lose faith and make a decision based on fear. A fear of a, a godless future that doesn't even exist. Vengeance belongs to God, not us. So yeah, they let the guy go and... Then they end up in this sticky situation where Jimmy's foot is in a bear trap for some reason, and then the guy comes back and saves them. And it's all supposed to be this big lesson in forgiveness that shows people how people can change, and... You know, it's whatever. It's certainly not the worst plot point I've ever seen in one of these movies, but I will say that the way this ended was kind of strange because in the process of trying to practice Christian values, the main girl learns the lesson that sometimes you need to kill people. I can't do it. You will do it, or Jimmy will die. Pick it up. You take the guy with the machete on three. One, two. And that feels wrong. And that was the main issue I had with this. It's unambiguously pro-gun, and it's unambiguously pro-God, but it never really manages to reconcile how those two beliefs mesh with one another. It does this weird thing where it makes Jimmy pro-gun and anti-Christian, and his sister anti-gun and pro-Christian, and then it has them argue their points all throughout the movie. But by having their viewpoints be so diametrically opposed, the movie will often end up making a point in favor of Christianity to the detriment of guns, or vice versa, and it all feels very muddy to me. I feel like a good example of what I'm talking about is this scene, and uh, before I play it, content warning for... I don't know, raccoon murder, I guess? To me, God is love, in spite of our lack of understanding. Saying it doesn't prove it. I want to know how a loving God could let that happen to Becca. Jesus came to save. The devil, he, he, he kills and he steals and he destroys. Do not blame God for the devil's sin. Well, is God in control or not? Look, you blame the devil for everything. But isn't he still under God's control? Tell me so. Who's to blame? The stick or the hand holding the stick? The hand holding the stick! You blame me for all of our stuff getting stolen and accusing me of falling asleep. Well, was God asleep? Or how about when Becca was... <laughs> Sorry, it was the gun's fault. Jimmy is literally arguing against Christianity by using the most common pro-gun argument that there is, and that feels very weird. There is no doubt in my mind that the people making this believe both that guns don't kill people, people do, and that God isn't responsible for our bad actions. But by setting things up in this way, they've created a situation where both things can't be true. 
I think that the closest this movie comes to balancing its beliefs is this scene where one of the characters references a passage in the Bible where Jesus says you're allowed to protect yourself. Jesus told his disciples to buy a sword just for self-defense. Two of them. I just don't understand your aversion to defending yourself. I am against killing people and guns kill people. And that's why the bad guys shouldn't be the only ones to have them. It is not murder to kill someone in self-defense. You're being stricter than God. But even that simple point feels a little bit contradictory to a lot of the other stuff that this movie seems to believe. Just one scene earlier, the same girl who says it's not a sin to kill someone in self-defense speaks at Kevin Sorbo's funeral and she says this. You wouldn't want to sat for long. When our old green go-kart broke. Are you sad? Not really. Why? Because we knew Dad was going to buy us a new one. I'm bad everything is brand new now. If he could tell us one thing, he would tell us that God is still good. And hearing that, all I can think is that if you really do believe that once you die, you go to a place where everything is better and new, then why the fuck do you give a shit about defending yourself? The situations this movie presents are so hellish that there were many times while I was watching this where I thought, like, I probably would have just given up about 20 minutes ago. And I am terrified of what comes next. The fact that most of these characters seem to believe that what comes next is paradise makes me think that they should feel comfortable in this situation knowing that the time has come for them to shed their mortal coil. But instead the lesson here is that sometimes you need to kill people in order to protect your flesh. This movie doesn't really seem to have a clear idea how Christianity and guns fit together, and I think the reason for that is that they don't really. And that being the case, it makes it so much weirder that so many people are so fanatically devoted to both of them at the same time, and it kind of made me wonder why that is. So I thought about it, and I actually did think of something that connected the two. Fear. I feel like people know that it's a big scary world out there and more than anything all they want is a little peace of mind. So they look for it in anything that they can. And whether that thing is an all-knowing God who's looking out for your every move or a pistol that can blow away your enemies, once they find it they cling to it as hard as they can because anything less than 100% certainty in their protectors means admitting that the world around them is still big and scary no matter what they do. I feel like guns and God are two very different things that both offer people comfort and so a lot of people in search of comfort ignore how different they are and embrace both. And then in their efforts to harmonize these two things that really shouldn't exist in harmony, it kind of feels like they end up getting their wires crossed a little bit. The level of devotion people had to their firearms in this movie left me feeling like they view them as a sort of god. They're this infallible protector that they carry with them at all times and trust to such a degree that it means that they'll never turn their back on them. And rather than saying, okay, I really only need one of those, they choose both, and one starts to feed into the other. One thing that watching this really hammered home for me is the fact that gun culture has a very binary way of thinking. The movie made it abundantly clear that there are good guys and bad guys. Uh, like it's not even subtext, it's actual text. Mom, what now? These men are deputies. They're going to take us someplace safe. Really? We're the good guys. I'm Jace. And I'm his big brother, Dave. And that makes sense. 
After all, the thing you always hear is that the only way to defeat a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. But in order to believe that, you need to believe in bad and good, which feels very Christian to me. The entire religion is built on the existence of this dichotomy. Bad and good, right and wrong, God and the devil, heaven and hell. But where Christianity alone is meant to help you navigate a world full of good and bad, it kind of seems like Christianity plus guns has taught people that they can take the bad and shoot it in its fucking face. And that's unfortunate because I honestly don't think that things are that black and white. Uh, like obviously there are bad people out there, but I think that there are a lot less of them than you might think. Even in this movie that's predicated on the idea that people are good and bad, all of the quote unquote bad people are really just economically disenfranchised and looking for food, which... Yeah, I feel like the case could be made that that's kind of true for the real world too. Every time I read news stories about social programs and libraries and shit being gutted in favor of more funding for the police, it makes me want to scream because, like, where do people think crime comes from? Very few people go out and shoot people just because they think it's fun. The vast majority do it because they have some need that is not being properly met. And that's the ultimate irony of all of this, because if people started practicing Christianity as it was actually taught, rather than the weird perverted gun version of it, then their need for guns would be greatly reduced. My major takeaway from watching The Reliant is that what gun people need more than anything is faith. Uh, not faith in a higher power, faith in humanity. People need to learn that for as scary as the world is, maybe it's not actually that scary. It only seems that way because everyone is trying to defend themselves. And maybe if we can learn to lead with compassion rather than the barrel of a gun, other people will do the same because most people are a lot more than just good or evil. I feel like people turn to guns because more than anything, they just want to ensure their own security. But that's not what faith is all about. Faith is feeling secure in things that aren't always sure. Or, or I guess it could also be a little girl's name. But yeah, that's my video. Boom. Uh, please like and subscribe and share and comment and uh, turn on notifications. I don't know. I feel like I'm supposed to say that, but I also feel like getting notifications for my videos would probably be very annoying. So if you want to make sure you see my videos, turn on notifications. But if you want to just let fate decide, then... Yeah, I don't want more notifications on my phone either. Also, I've been um, slowly realizing that there's a reason why YouTubers do the things that they do because comments seem to be really helpful in getting my videos more views. So uh, I'm going to do that annoying YouTuber thing of posing a question. So uh, I guess like everyone say what was your favorite and least favorite part of this video? Comment below. I should have come up with a better question, but honestly, now I'm curious. Also, if you have a couple of extra bucks and are looking to support the channel, you can always go to my Patreon or Super Thanks Me, which, speaking of, I have some Super Thanks to Super Thanks back. Thank you to Toxic Soup. I am probably wrong. Ashley Boots 3386, Rats and Flowers, Victoria E. Meredith, and Callista 5194 times two. Um, thank you guys all so much. I really appreciate it. It really helps out the channel. Um, I'm sorry I haven't re responded to most of your comments yet.
um, but I am bad about doing that stuff and then I don't do it for a while and then the thought of doing it makes me anxious so that I don't do it for longer. Also, thank you to everyone who came out to my um, live premiere and there are a lot of people who tip me on that which YouTube doesn't save. So, um, I don't know what to do about that. If I really thank you, know that you are thanked and appreciated and if you want me to shout you out, just leave a comment below saying that you uh, tip me on a, um, on, on a live premiere and I will say thank you in the next video. But yeah, that's my video. That's probably an inappropriate way to end it, but whatever. Just kidding, it's not the end. I still have that last part where I pose for a thumbnail and then all my patrons' names scroll up the screen. And uh, for this one, honestly, my like I, I, I try to fight it, but really every single time I make a thumbnail that just says problematic on it. The video does a million times better. And like I, I, I try to avoid it because I feel like I'm not even like talking about problematic. Like I am talking about problematic shit, but like I feel like I'm like I'm problematic. Everyone's problem. I don't like give a crap. I don't know. But people like seeing prop. So I'm going to just do the same thumbnail I did last time. But instead of having, um, that movie's poster, I'm going to have the Reliance poster, and I guess, like, since it's guns, I'll be, like, like, scared. Scared seems right. Um, but I can also, I guess, so, like, horrified, I guess, because that's scared and reacting to problematic. Like, what? Actually, wait. What does my face look like? That's, that's good. I can't see the viewfinder that well, so I'll, I'll practice the face first. This, maybe I'll just do this like should I should I move back and go oh, I'll show him a little knee that'll get the boys clicking <laughs> I'm sorry to any knee fetishists out there, but I found that very silly. Um, why did I, I, I was like, I was going here and then I was like going back, although I kind of like this. Like, guns. <sighs> Maybe that, like, like. I feel like I should get contacts, but every time I go to the doctor about my eyes, they always are like, your eyes are fine. And, and then I'm like, but clearly they're not because I felt the need to come to the doctor. But then it feels like stolen valor to wear glasses sometimes because it's like legally they're fine. But like, I don't know, this looks blurry. Um, no. Guns. I think the head tilt works a little bit like. Oh wait, I also said I was gonna knit. Last, I'll try that again. Like. I feel like I've done so many of 
of this particular type of video that I, I don't even need to pose for a thumbnail anymore, kind of. I can just use like a good picture that I already had. I feel like I should try a video. I know the people who are still watching this will probably be like, no, but I feel like I should try a video where I don't do this. Because I feel like based on my stats, there's like a sharp drop off when this part starts. And um, it might be the case that that's hurting me. Guns? What? <gasps> I don't know what people are supposed to look like. Um, hopefully there's something in there. If not, this could be the first time where I just reuse a thing. I'm a level with you guys. I'm a little hungover, so um, it's probably not the best posing segment. I think I need to give up wine, which is unfortunate because it's my favorite, but it's of the alcohols, it gives me a hangover and loosens my lips the most. Spoilers for a future episode, possibly. Uh, anyway, that's Willie. What? I don't know. Goodbye.